it is so good to be back. I loved being here last week, just sitting in the congregation and worshiping, and Will just had a great message, and truth is, I, I was able to listen to all the messages, and they were incredible, so I'm kind of intimidated to be back, because uh, y'all had better preaching while I was gone, and, um, but it really was a gift to be uh, on sabbatical, emotionally, intellectually, just feel uh, uh, just really, um, really great. And physically, I mean, that's a six-month-old for you, right? And, uh, but uh, uh, I'm looking forward to sharing a little bit in a couple weeks just with you about my experience, some of the things that God showed me and taught me, and uh, I'd love for you to hear a little bit about that. And so, anyways, again, thank you very much. Thank you, personnel team. Uh, we have a, uh, you already know this, we have a great staff. And so, uh, you know, nothing, nothing, uh, leak through the cracks other than when I got back and uh, so uh, we did have an exciting thing happen in our family uh, this week uh, what God had ordained before the foundation of time with us having uh, a little girl named Lucy uh, in our home the state recognized that so uh, Lucy Herstrom uh, uh, our six month old is now uh, one of us so that was fun that was fun well, uh, I would imagine that for many of us, we've used this term, you know, there's a, there's a special place for a guy like that. And, and when we use that term, when we say, you know, there's, there's that's my daughter crying. And uh, <laughs> she doesn't want me to preach either. She's like, oh, it's the good preaching. But when we've used that term, we're probably not talking about a special place like Disney World for that person, right? We're not saying, man, there's a special place for that person, and we think that, you know, that's milk and cookies, or we're, we're definitely not saying that that's heaven. And if you believe in purgatory, I don't, but we, we don't even think that that's a place reserved for purgatory. When we, when we usually say, you know, there's a special place for that perpetrator, or that victimizer, or that person we just don't like, or maybe they say something that we don't like, we go, you know, there's a special place for that guy. You know what I'm talking about? Now, we reserve that most of the time for some of those figures out there that we just don't want to have anything to do with. You know, the, the Kim Jong-uns of the world, right? And quite frankly, I mean, that guy's a bad dude. 30% of the population is in abject poverty. In fact, there's people turning to cannibalism right now because they can't get food. Or the Castro brothers, a uh, brother now. And I uh, had a wonderful time in Cuba uh, a few weeks ago. Man, God's doing some amazing work uh, in his church there. Our seminary is doing great. But here's a guy who promised education, medical, food, and, and uh, people can only survive because of the black market. They have to go and purchase food if you want if, 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 anything outside of rice. If, if you want meat, if you want metal, if you want uh, uh, medicine, you got to go to the black market. Promise great medical care, and yet things that we take for granted, like aspirin and ibuprofen, can't even be found in their national hospital. Or maybe human trafficking and slavery. I mean, traffickers generate hundreds of billions of dollars in profits every year by trafficking millions of people around the world to do things that they don't want to do through threats, violence, deception, bondage, and manipulate over and over to force people to provide things that they would never do on their own. Over 40 million victims currently of trafficking. There's a special place for them, right? 81% of those that are trapped in, in human trafficking are forced labor. 25% of them children, 75% are women and girls. It's a $150 billion industry. Or maybe Middle Eastern marriage practices. 
You know, one out of nine girls below the age of 15 are forced into some type of marriage, typically with a guy who is probably 25 years old or more. Now, there's precedence there because Muhammad, his, one of his wives, was a six-year-old girl named Aisha. And we typically say, you know, there's a special place for them. Or maybe Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood, in her book, Woman in the New Race, she said the most merciful thing that a large family does to one of its infant members is to kill it. She goes on to say the most serious evil and most immoral practice of the day is breeding too many children. And we say things, well, there's a special place for her. Or maybe those figures that are, are just untouchable, like Joseph Stalin, who's responsible for 40 million deaths, or Adolf Hitler, who's responsible for 50 million deaths, or uh, Mao Zedong, the, the former chairman and, and architect of the Cultural Revolution in China, who's responsible for 77 million deaths. And we say, well, there's a special place for them. Or maybe it's those government governmental leaders that exist with us today who serve based on their own, own whims and desires and making decisions for personal gain rather than for those that they represent. But I also know that sometimes we reserve that phrase, you know, there's a special place for them for those relationships that are actually close to us, but at some point betrayed us and now there's deep hurt and woundedness in our life maybe that's a boss who made a decision that has changed our career a neighbor who drives too fast in the neighborhood a, a, a guy who steals your parking space on a day when you're late a co-worker who took the promotion that you deserved or maybe you just don't like the way they do something and it just doesn't line up with maybe a, a, a preference that you have or maybe a leader makes a change that doesn't jive with your tradition but there's a special place for them right I mean do these people deserve grace I'm not talking about justice uh, uh, God is all about justice we, we should be about justice but do these people deserve grace should there be mercy of any sort expressed to these people we talked about that may be untouchable to us but even those who are closer to us do they deserve grace and and <laughs> who's going to who's going to show them that you know what Jesus said about a special place he actually said in John 14 verses 2 and 3 that he was preparing a special place for all of mankind and that may that may just not it may be hard to compute that Jesus would actually long to and desire and even, f even for it to be represented in his word from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation that he would want to express grace to the type of, of perpetrators and victimizers that maybe we've come across. I mean, I think oftentimes... Um, I mean, I'll say that this, is, this has been true for me at points, that we desire a person's destruction rather than their salvation. That's why, you know, we have special places for them. You know, it's easy to love the victim, and, and it's so difficult to love the perpetrator, the victimizer, isn't it? I mean, in fact, it's easy to stay and be the victim and never seek the salvation of the one who perpetrated or victimized. But here's the reality that we see in Scripture. Is that unless you're the Son of God, then you and I are perpetrators also. And you say, well, I mean, I'm nothing like Hitler. I'm not, I'm not a child trafficker. But yet Jesus' 
grace expressed on the cross covers all of human kind. But we're going to be back in Acts. Uh, we left a couple months ago, um, and we had, we'd been through Acts 1 through 8, and I'll get you caught up here in a second. We're going to be in Acts chapter 9, uh, just the first half of Acts chapter 9. We'll do the second half next week, and and uh, man, what a good passage. And so if you have your Bibles or your phones or whatever, get to Acts chapter 9. And uh, just, just to uh, uh, catch you up, so Jesus dies on the cross for humanity. He expresses his grace and allows us to have righteousness uh, as a result of uh, even despite our sin. For those of us who, who, who respond to Jesus, his righteousness is poured over us, and that allows us to have a relationship with a holy, perfect God. And then he is, he's risen three days later. He, he makes some appearances to some folks. He comes back to life. He tells his disciples, they're hanging around one day, he tells his disciples that I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit, I want you to go to Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world, and I want you to be my witnesses all over the, the place. And then Jesus ascends, and the disciples are just standing there, and they're just going, well, what just happened? I mean, he just went up into the air, disappeared, bam, which would have been really cool to see. But they run back to Jerusalem, expectantly praying, waiting for the Holy Spirit to fall on them. Well, the Holy Spirit comes, and the Holy Spirit does fall, fall at this feast that, that's called uh, Pentecost. And when the Holy Spirit falls, these disciples begin to speak in all these different tongues and languages so that everybody that's at the feast from different nations who may not speak a certain dialect, they can hear the word of God. They can hear the gospel message. And 3,000 people come to know Jesus. It was amazing. And then at the end of Acts chapter 2, uh, Peter begins to talk about kind of the principles and priorities of the church. Well, in Acts chapter 3, Peter heals a 40-year-old man who had never been able to walk before, and then he preaches another sermon, and 2,000 more people are added to the church. And then Peter and John, I mean, the Sanhedrin, these are the Jewish leaders, like, man, I don't, I don't think we like this. this. This bucks up against tradition. They, they bring Peter and John in for questioning, right? And, and they essentially say, I mean, you know, these are common men, and uh, uneducated, but you know what? They've been with Jesus. And, and so when you and I are with Jesus, it makes us uncommon. And they recognize that these were uncommon men, but they were still thrown into jail. Shortly after that, they, they were released. The church celebrated, they praised. And, and then the church continued to pray, but they prayed for boldness rather than relief. They didn't say, you know what? Uh, we don't need any more of this persecution. Rather, they said, in the midst of persecution, let's make sure that Jesus is known. Well, then we get to Acts chapter 5. There's, a, there's a, a couple named Ananias and Sapphira. They deceive the Holy Spirit, lie about their gifts to the church. God strikes them down, and the next week contributions skyrocket. But despite all the conflict inside the church and outside the church, the apostles continue to preach the gospel, and more and more people come to know the king. And then we see in Acts chapter 6, there's some prejudice and discrimination taking place between some Greek and Jewish believers, and church leadership said, we're not going to have any of that. So they begin to address the problem. They appoint some men of high character and integrity to uh, begin to serve all folks because murmuring in the church is just one of those uh, 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 just destroyed things and, and they didn't want that to happen then we see at the end of Acts chapter 6 and all of Acts chapter 7 this incredible guy named Stephen who it says that he is filled with the Holy Spirit and he is stoned to death by this guy named Saul who we're going to talk a lot about today and Saul stones him to death but he suffers well and then we see at the beginning of Acts chapter 8 Philip is preaching to a group of people in Samaria. Revival breaks out. Then there's this occult leader who tries to purchase the Holy Spirit. And Peter's like, mm, not going to happen. And then God transports Philip to this Ethiopian eunuch who's just riding alongside uh, a, a, a dusty, dirty road and reading Scripture, but he's not in, uh, understanding what it is. And Philip walks up to him. And what we see here is that when you have a willing witness and uh, seeking soul, there's always a divine encounter. And that's where we find ourselves now in Acts chapter 9, okay? So, here it is. It says, but Saul... So this is the guy in Acts 6 and 7 that is, is the leader that's kind of making sure that the, the, the Christian church is being destroyed. And he's ultimately the guy who's responsible for Stephen's death, we believe. 
But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, uh, just real quick, side note. So when it's talking about people of the way, this is how they were des- Christians were described. They weren't calling them Christians at this point. They are calling them people of the way. Now this makes sense because Jesus said in John uh, 14, 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. And so the, the way they knew Christians was the way they lived for Jesus. Now, that ought to still be true of the church today. I mean, Jesus wants his church to be known for his ways. The church was designed and purposed to reach the disenfranchised and disciple people. That means there ought not be stumbling blocks within the church other than Jesus himself. Scripture's pretty clear about that. That that Christ ought to be the only stumbling block for somebody to come to saving faith. In fact, we, we see a picture of this later on in Acts. We'll get to there at some point, but let me give you a synopsis because I think it's just important for us to, to note real quick. But there's this controversy that arose in, in the church of Jerusalem and Gentiles were being converted to faith in record numbers, but some of the believers, and these, these guys were the, the ones who happened to be, uh, well, they didn't happen to be, but they were. They, they were former Pharisees. And these guys, I mean, these were the kind of the traditionalists of the church, and they were saying, you know what? Uh, we, we should make sure that they hold to some Jewish tradition still. So they should be circumcised. And Paul's, Paul, in, in Acts 15, he, he says, and that's crazy. I mean, that's the Eric Standard Version translation. But uh, word for word, he says, you should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. I mean, in other words, we should remove any unnecessary barrier that would prevent a person from coming to faith and engaging in biblical community. Again, I mean, it's understood that we can't control all the barriers that people have against Christianity. But of the things that we can control, we should address them appropriately. The only stumbling block that the church should bear is Christ himself. You say, well, you know, that just sounds politically correct. It has nothing to do with political correctness. It has to do with presenting Christ and his ways. Let's move on. You're going, please move on. Please move on. Look at verse 3. Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him, and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, but rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus, and for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now here's a highly educated man, high-functioning leader, and now he has immediately gone blind and he hasn't eaten uh, or had anything to drink for three days. He had just also experienced hearing the voice of Jesus, whom I don't know where he was after the resurrection and the burial, but this has to be blowing his mind right now. Look at verse 10. Now, there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. Okay, this is not Ananias of Acts chapter 5. Okay, that guy's dead. And you go, they're not very creative with names. Well, truth of the matter is they didn't have many names. People were, they they, uh, maybe had about three dozen different names. Uh, Romans had about three dozen different names. They were typically known uh, for what they did and then family lineage. And and that's also true of um, uh, uh, Jewish as well. So there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus 
named Saul. For behold, he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized. And taking food, he was strengthened. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus, and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon his name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. Man, I love that story. Man, you can't, there's some good amen in going on over here. If there wants to be some amen in going on over here, totally good. So we'll give you a lot of opportunity the rest of the, the sermon. So thank you for those amens. Just got to teach y'all to amen. I mean, this is exciting stuff, you know. So I think there's some, some things that probably just, I mean, this burst onto Saul's consciousness as these events were happening I mean for all he knew Jesus was dead and now Jesus is alive and having a conversation with him I mean that's nuts uh, he, he would have known Old Testament scripture so well he would have known all the prophecies of the fulfillment of the Messiah but up to this point it wasn't Jesus and now Jesus has come back from the dead and he's speaking to Saul but I think too there's a couple things that he begins to realize that this persecution against the church isn't just against the church but it's against Christ the Messiah I mean he, uh, Jesus says why, why are you persecuting me sin against Jesus and sin against the church vice versa but I love the fact that this is just a great reminder to never write anyone off as being beyond the love of Christ you know just a side note uh, this, is, this is where in this passage uh, toward the end of verse 19 through 22 it's kind of where they believe that, that Paul after he became a follower of Jesus follower of the way that he took probably for sure at least three years, maybe up to ten years away, just preparing for his public ministry. And uh, Damascus was just on the tip of the Arabian desert, and, and we know from Galatians chapter 1 that he eventually goes to the Arabian desert for at least three years, if not longer than that. But this is kind of where he, after he, this conversion took place, that he began to just allow Jesus to train him and others train him and church train him. Uh, pretty amazing stuff. So, so, so what is it about this passage we need to walk away with this morning? What are those Sunday to Monday takeaways? Listen, we recognize that God has given you a kingdom platform right where you are. God wants you to bloom where you're planted. So, so he wants you to take this and apply it tomorrow. He doesn't want you to just store it up here and be like, okay, this will be good. This way I know when, when he's going through the book of Acts, I know what's coming next. No, this is for us to, to take and, and walk with. So what, what's some of that stuff? So here's the thing. Saul, who eventually becomes Paul, I may get that mixed up a little bit, so I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and uh, uh, confess to you. If I say Paul, just know I'm saying Saul, because in a couple weeks we're going to be talking about Paul. But uh, Saul, this guy is a Christian killer. 
I mean, he, he's at Stephen's death, Acts 6 and 7. He had paperwork, it said, from the authorities. I mean, he had full rights just to murder anybody who was of the way. I mean, he was the Mao, he was the Hitler, he was the Stalin of the early church. But here's what I love about this, is what we see here is that salvation is a Jesus thing. Salvation is a Jesus thing, real simple. But what we see over and over in Scripture is that Jesus is the hunter, he's the initiator of transformation. Some have called him the hound of heaven. Of, of heaven. But salvation is a Jesus thing. So this expression of grace that maybe we wouldn't want to give somebody with his record. I mean, grace is a Jesus thing. A mercy that maybe we wouldn't want to extend to somebody with his record. Mercy is a Jesus thing. Forgiveness is a Jesus thing. By the way, obedience is a kingdom responsibility. It's also a Jesus thing. And, but this is good news for us. This is good news for Paul and Ananias. I mean, it was good news for, for, for Saul. Sorry, I messed it up a second here. It was good news for Saul because this guy was unable to save himself. Unable to save himself. It's good news for Ananias because Jesus initiates the relationship with other, others and the pressure is off him to do anything. This is, this is what we call, uh, you, you've heard called the Damascus Road experience. You know, we, we usually use that terminology when somebody has a dramatic change in spiritual direction. We said, man, they, they had a Damascus Road experience, right? This is where that, that idea comes from. But here's what, I, here's what I'm reminded of, too. Is for Ananias, he, he had an incredible part in this. We focus so much on that Damascus Road experience, and we ought to. I mean, salvation, again, is a Jesus thing. This is a wonderful thing. But Ananias had a responsibility. I love what uh, 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10 says. But you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are a people, God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. You know, a lot of times we, we talk about the priesthood of the believer, and oftentimes we think about that in terms of rights that we have. But what this scripture tells us is that it's really about responsibilities that we have kingdom ones at that well here's here's the other thing so salvation is a Jesus thing secondly you're the chosen instrument you're the chosen instrument it, Jesus makes it really clear to Ananias that that Paul is a chosen instrument too right now think about this I mean that's a that's a good thing Paul or, or Saul Paul educated in the best Roman schools, understood uh, the, the Jewish Torah. He had a Jewish birthright. He also was uh, born in a Roman town, so he had Roman credentials. He knew the scriptures from his education. He had spent significant time in Jewish and Roman leadership circles. He was single, which was an incredible blessing. God used his singleness to multiply his work. So God knew what he was doing here. But recognize, too, that Ananias was a chosen instrument as well. I mean, he uses chosen instruments to speak to other chosen instruments. He was addressing Ananias in every bit that way. You know, I think we often want to look to a program to connect people to some type of life change, but, but God uses people not not programs. He uses people in programs. There's nothing wrong with programs. 
But he was using Ananias. And I love his response. Here I am. Now that came with some fear and trepidation after he found out what his assignment was, right? I mean, this guy, this guy, uh, Saul, I mean, he had, he had a bad rep. You know, for Ananias, there was a little bit of fear. You know, I, I wonder for us, I mean, what keeps us maybe from being that chosen instrument to share? Is it fear? Is it maybe the change in relationship that might take place? Maybe it's a self-righteousness that they don't deserve it. But I'm so grateful that we have this picture of Ananias who says, here I am, and although he asked some questions, is this the guy you're talking about, the guy that has been murdering all the Christians? It says in verse 17 that he still, he departed and he entered Saul's house. Here's what I hope we get, is that, is that when God says go, that we would simply trust that he set the table. And what a great picture of that we have. Saul's heart was prepared in every way for Ananias to come and speak into that. On Thursdays uh, of VBS, we typically, that's, that's our kind of gospel sharing time. We pull the kids out early that morning. Uh, we share the gospel with them, and um, then they go back to their classroom. We did that this year like we normally do. We had some kids respond, which is really cool. And uh, then about 10 minutes after we dismiss, I was in the fellowship hall, and I see one of our workers, Kristen, come, and she's uh, briskly walking toward a table of some women, and she says, there's a harvest happening in my room. We need more counselors. We don't have enough adults. Can y'all, can y'all come and help? And that's, yeah, that's an amen. Like, that was a perfect opportunity. Yeah, yeah. That, I mean, it was amazing. Now, you need to understand, I mean, there's, certainly there's a program that, was, uh, that helped facilitate that, but that's a result of people being obedient. That's a result of a relationship that Christian had built and, and her, uh, the other teachers in her classroom that they had built all week long and as the kids were hearing the gospel and as they were, they were coloring and everything else that led to an understanding of who Jesus was. They didn't do it in big group when, you know, the pastor preacher was there. They went back to those that they trusted. See, Jesus set the table. And it was. It was an amazing, amazing thing. He said, well, boy, this just seems really difficult. Like, like this is, uh, man, I, I, I got a guy, Eric, that I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about that as you're preaching, I mean, I just see his face. And, you know, I see, I see that girl, I mean, she's so loud in my office all the time. And, and um, uh, but I just don't know that I have anything to share with them. I don't want to, by the way, either, Eric. So, so here, here's, here's what Scripture shows us here with Ananias, is that Jesus helped Ananias simply meet a need that Saul had. And he set the table. But he said, go and meet this need. Go and meet this need. See, Jesus uses need meeting often as a catalyst to God meeting. Now, real simple. I mean, a takeaway from, from today to tomorrow, perhaps one of those Saul's that, that you're thinking of, I mean, what's the simple way just to begin to need a need that they, need that they have? Now, let, me, let me finish this. People are dropping like flies anyways. It's not like a whole section like get up and leave, including my wife. I don't know what that tells you. Uh, but uh, I don't know what's going on, but uh, uh, distractions uh, all over the place this morning. So, um, you know, here, here, ultimately, here's what I want for, for me. Here's what I want for us. Again, I love, I love Ananias' heart here. Here I am. You know, he doesn't say, what now? He doesn't say, hold on. You know, when things kind of slow down, I'll be available. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't say, I'm too tired right now. He, do, he, he doesn't say, I don't want to put myself out there. He just says, here I am. Before he knew his assignment, he, he just said, here I am. I mean, there was an abandonment already to Jesus. 
He didn't have to know all the details. He didn't need an Excel spreadsheet that lined it out, his schedule for, for, for everything. He, he just said, here I am. And, and here's, here's what I don't want in my life or in yours. I, I don't want the, the primary here I am in my life is anything other than Jesus. And I think we say, here I am to a bunch of things. You know, here I am for pleasure. Here I am for that sale at the mall. Here I am for that new movie. Here I am for that sports team. Here I am for that extracurricular activity. Here I am for my job. Here I am for my child. Here I am for my audition. Here I am for my family. I mean, we say, here I am, and make that a primary response to so many things. I mean, even Paul, he was caught up in saying, here I am, but it was to the Sanhedrin and Pharisees and, and to this cause uh, against the way and, and to religion, and yet he still recognized there was no satisfaction, there was no joy, there was no contentment. Until he said, here I am to Jesus. But Ananias knew. I, man, I'm passionate about a lot of things. I, I know you are too, but I don't want to be devoted to anything other than Jesus. And, and the primary reason is a selfish reason, by the way. Because I know that that ultimately is where joy lives. See, here I am is like a password to a life of contentment and joy and excitement. You know, I think, I think sometimes though we doubt that that God is good or committed uh, to our joy. I think sometimes we doubt that. And some, some of the time, I think it's because we can't see any good reason uh, for something to happen out of some of the circumstances we find ourselves in. And so we don't think that God is for us or that, that he's doing something good on our behalf, but I think what Ananias knew and what Saul came to know and, and what I want us to know is that, that we can trust a God that sacrifices himself on our behalf to be committed to our good, to our joy, to our contentment all the time so that my here I am is a trusting statement as much as a primary one. There was a, there's a game that we all play called Hide and Seek. I, I used to play this with Emma Grace. I hope to play this with Lucy again. Uh, but Hide and Seek, it's not just peekaboo, but you know Hide and Seek where they go and hide. And so here's how this kind of would play out for me. Probably similar to you. Is I, uh, Emma Grace would, and I would, okay, we're going to play Hide and Seek. Okay, Dad, this is going to be great. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go hide. And then I would start counting really loud. One... Two, I hear giggles. Three, Dad, come on. <laughs> Four, all right, here I come. And she, she hid in the same place <laughs> every time. Every time, it never changed. But good fathers go through the motions and they act like they don't know where they are. So I'm walking around. Is Emma Grace under the bed? And I could hear these little giggles. <laughs> right? Oh, she's not under the bed. Is she behind the door? You hear the giggles? You know, I'd walk into another room. I'd, I'd go into the bathroom. Is Emma Grace in the bathtub? And I'd pull back the, the sheet, and you hear giggles. She always liked it when I'd say, Did she fall in the toilet? And I'd pick it up and slam it back down, and I'd hear these giggles that she was trying to suppress, right? And then it didn't take long. I'd walk out typically in the hallway, and she would come out of the closet, which I knew she was already there, and she'd go, Dad, 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 here I am, here I am, here I am. And I'd try to explain to her that's not how you play the game. <laughs> but you see, the object for Emma Grace was being found and to rush into her father's arms. Now that's how it ought to 
will be for you and me. As we approach this life of the way, like Ananias, here I am. Whatever you ask of me, I'm yours. And we rush into the Father's arms because we know that he is yours.